Yeah, hi everyone. So we are going to have a very interesting lecture ahead. So the last lecture was probably a little bit, um, I would say, more borderline boring because it was like the setup and bias and variance decomposition, not the most exciting topic. This uh, lecture we will be talking about different resampling techniques more concretely, doing some simulations on some data sets to see how yeah, um, data set uh, resampling affects the training of the algorithms like uh, pessimistic and optimistic biases by just dividing a data set into a training and a test set um, because then we if we divide this uh, data set into a test and a training set we uh, reduce the size that we have available for training which can affect the model performance um, yeah and then we will also talk about confidence intervals uh, different methods for constructing confidence intervals for example using the normal approximation intervals but also looking at several different bootstrapping techniques and um, yeah drawing confidence intervals for your performance estimates is an increasingly important topic in machine learning so um, for example recently when I submitted some papers nowadays um, they require you to include confidence intervals and also reviewers started to take that more seriously because back in the day um, that wasn't such a serious topic in machine learning. Many people just reported a final test set accuracy without any confidence intervals and it was okay. I mean, it's still largely okay, but um, it's becoming more important to include these confidence intervals because that's uh, nowadays the expectation of that field. And it's also just useful, not only for the reviewers, but also for other people uh, reading your papers and uh, looking at your models. So with that, yeah, then let's get started and talk about these topics. All right, yeah, this is the second video on model evaluation, and we are going to cover confidence intervals and resampling methods. So here's the overview of the topics that we are going to cover in this lecture. I try to yeah, um, separate them a little bit more so that the videos are shorter and not as long. I hope this time they will be really shorter than usual. So we will start with an introduction. Then we will talk about the holdout method for model evaluation. Then we will take a look at the holdout method for model selection. So the difference is here, it's just used for evaluating a model. And then we will take a look how we can use it for model selection. Then we will start to look at confidence intervals, how we can um, yeah, construct confidence intervals for our performance estimates. And the first method we are going to look at is the normal approximation interval. After that, we will take a look at resampling methods that means yeah we are resampling the data set uh, we will take a look at the repeated holdout method where we will apply the holdout methods on yeah resampled versions of the training set and then after that we will take a look at empirical confidence intervals which are also based on resampling and here we will encounter a familiar technique the bootstrap technique that we talked about when we uh, yeah discussed bagging in the ensemble model lecture. And yeah, after we saw how we can make um, empirical confidence intervals using the bootstrap method, we will take a look at two improved versions of the bootstrap method for model evaluation. It's called the 0.632 bootstrap and the 0.632 plus bootstrap. Okay. So on the previous slide, I showed you what we are going to cover in this lecture in a more detailed way. Here, um, this is the overview of putting this lecture in context with the other model evaluation lectures. So last time we covered the bias variance trade-off and we discussed how that's related to overfitting and underfitting. And I think we spent way too much time on this, but in any case, um, in this lecture, we will cover, uh, I would say, a selection of more important topics in a shorter time frame, I hope. So here we are covering a whole chunk of methods, the holdout method for model evaluation, how we can construct confidence intervals um, without resampling and then using resampling um, techniques to yeah, um, do the repeated holdout and also construct empirical confidence intervals using the bootstrap techniques. Then uh, next time in the next model evaluation lecture in model evaluation 3, so lecture 10 model evaluation 3, we will also talk about cross-validation techniques. So in this lecture we will not talk about cross-validation, we will talk about cross-validation in the next lecture, how we can use it for hyperparameter tuning, model selection and even algorithm selection. 
And then in model evaluation four, we will cover some statistical tests for model evaluation. Um, this will be, I hope, rather short. There are a bunch of yeah, interesting techniques to cover, but uh, in practice, they are not very often used. And I would say most of the time, the problem is that we have independence violations. So as you know from other classes for statistical tests, we always have a whole bunch of assumptions that we have to make. And in machine learning, it's kind of hard to meet the assumptions of most statistical, statistical tests. So there are some adjustments, but even then, um, yeah, there are some uh, practical issues with these tests. So that usually empirical methods uh, like cross-validation are uh, preferred. However, there are also some statistical tests that combine cross-validation with um, yeah, hypothesis testing procedures. And we will also take a look at these. So there are some interesting techniques to cover and uh, techniques that are also useful in practice, even though not many people use them, maybe because they are less known and maybe a little bit tricky to implement. But yeah, we will take a look at that. And then lastly, in model evaluation five, uh, we will talk about uh, evaluation metrics, so beyond the typical accuracy. So, so far we are just talking mostly about the classification accuracy and the classification error, just be because it's simpler, but there are also many other metrics like precision recall, F1 score, the receiver operating characteristic under the curve, and others. So we will cover these then in uh, model evaluation 5. So as you can see, um, these lectures are not uh, introducing any new machine learning algorithms, but they are still very important for machine learning because these techniques allow you to compare different machine learning algorithms, which is super important because in practice it's really always hard to know which machine learning algorithm performs well on a given data set, so you have to try and compare a lot of them. And then also you want to find a good performing model, so you want to tune your model and so forth, and also for that yeah, you need good metrics and um, good approaches and a lot of care. So it's um, yeah, important that we kind of discuss this in a somewhat detailed manner because that's really what matters in practice. So yeah, in this slide I want to list some points, um, some of the main points, why we evaluate the predictive performance of a model. But before I tell you some of the reasons I have in mind, maybe uh, pause the video now and think of some reasons you may have. So think about why do you care about model performance? So why would you want to evaluate a model that you trained? Of course, you can say, okay, that's uh, so that I maybe get a good grade in the class project, but I can tell you the grade in the class project is not based on the performance of your model at all. It's more about the correct procedure that you use. Um, but besides that, let's say in practice, why do you care about evaluating a model well? So yeah, the obvious point is that we want to estimate um, the generalization performance. So that's the predictive performance of our model on future or unseen data. So when we train our model, we have no idea how well it performs in practice. So model evaluation is a step where we usually use an independent test set or um, some cross-validation techniques that don't require a test set. There are cross-validation techniques that also require a test set. There are many different kinds. We will talk about that later. But the main goal is to use some independent data to estimate how well the, uh, the algorithm or model will perform on unseen data or future data. So when you develop an application, let's say an iPhone application that can predict yeah, the, uh, or label your image database, like if you have a photo library on your iPhone and there's an algorithm, it's actually a thing that they do. They run machine learning algorithms to predict the class labels of these images so that if you search for these, um, that it gives you a selection of images that match this description. So you want to know not only how well that performs on the training data set, but you also want to know how well that might perform on the customer or iPhone user databases, which are all different from each other. So here we care about estimating the performance and this, uh, yeah, to give us an idea of how it will perform on unseen or new future data. But yeah, there's another reason why we care about evaluating the performance. Um, so usually we not only have one model, we usually have a whole bunch of models. And these models come from the fact that we uh, compare different machine learning algorithms to each other. So usually when we have an algorithm 
and then we have some training data. We get a model out of it. So we usually call the model the trained instance that comes out of applying an algorithm to a training data set. So usually we perform that many times so we can use the same training set and the same algorithm to get multiple models. So we can have model one and model two. And why are these models different? These could be different hyperparameter settings. It could be, for example, a k nearest neighbor algorithm with, um, with k equals three, and this could be k equals five, or decision trees with a different depth, for example, or gradient boosting classifiers with different learning rates. So by changing the hyperparameters, the models will be different. And um, we want to know which model performs better than the other because usually we are interested in selecting the best model. So we would compare between the two. And also in practice, we may use different algorithms. So if this is um, algorithm, let's say one, we may have, let me use the blue color here, algorithm one, we may have an algorithm two and that also gives us different models. So we have then model three and model, oops, four and so forth. So we now want to compare among all these different models. Or well, also in more general cases, we also maybe want to compare um, the, the different algorithms on to each other, just to get an idea which algorithm works better, let's say on image data sets, which algorithms work better on text data sets and so forth. So yeah, there are many different comparisons that we can make. So in that, in that sense, we not only care about how well the algorithm performs on unseen data, this is of course also important, but we also want to um, rank these models. So, so there are two ways I can select the best model here. So what I can do is I can compute um, or estimate the generalization performance in an absolute term. I can, for example, say, so the performance on unseen data is estimated to be, let's say, 95%, um, here is maybe 93%, uh, 91%, and then 98%. So if these numbers are absolutely accurate, then I can just pick the one with the highest percentage accuracy, and then I would say this has the best model. So I can actually use the performance on, uh, on the generalization performance that is estimated for future unseen data to select these algorithms. But the problem in practice is that this um, generalization performance is coming from the independent test set. And if we only have one independent test set, it is not independent anymore if we use it multiple times. So um, in that way, uh, in practice, there are usually two separate tasks. So I actually, in order to select the best model here, I don't need to know the absolute performance of these on the new or unseen data. The only thing I need to know in order to select the model, the best model here is to uh, yeah, just rank the models. So for example, oops, not sure what happened here. Oops. So all I have to do is I have to rank them. So if I look at the right side, I can say model three is worse than um, model two, which is then worse than model one, which is then worse than model four. And I can just have a ranking without having an absolutely correct estimate of the generalization performance to select the best model. So I could, for example, based on this one here, conclude model four is my best model even without knowing that it has, let's say, 98% um, accuracy on unseen data, I could then estimate it by using then the independent test set only one time to get this estimate. And by that, I avoid introducing a bias because when we use the test set multiple times, we introduce a bias, for example, a selection bias. So it's kind of related to multiple hypothesis testing. Um, just by chance, um, due to certain circumstances, you observe that uh, this model performs best on this test set, but you use the test set multiple times. So you kind of tuned your model uh, towards the test set to perf uh, towards performing uh, well on the test set. So you still don't know really how well it performs then on new data. So it's important to only use the test set once. 
Yeah, the third point is uh, we want to identify the machine learning algorithm that is best suited for the problem at hand. Th thus, we want to compare different algorithms, selecting the best performing one as well as the best performing model from the algorithm's hypothesis space. This is actually what I just talked about also in the previous slide. So if we go over it uh, one more time, this is like the um, absolute performance, not the relative ranking, the absolute performance on new data of a given model, then this is, um, yeah, selecting models, so um, ranking models. And this is the third one is um, ranking algorithms and the models that come from these algorithms. So two and three are relatively related where uh, point two is more about the model selection from a given algorithm like the hyperparameter tuning. And uh, step three is hyperparameter tuning, but also algorithm selection. So which algorithms should we select? And if we only compare the algorithms to each other, which one performs better? So for point three and a practical application would be, for example, developing an application that that uses one model per user. So if every user of your application has a separate model, then here it will become important to select the right algorithm. One such example is the archive sanity preserver, which is a paper recommendation system. So on that online system, every user has an own support vector machine that is trained just to the user to recommend certain articles. But maybe let's um, pick a simpler example. Think of an email spam classification system. So you have an email program And with this email program, you have a machine learning algorithm and then you have different users. So one, two and three, let's say, and you give this email program to each user. Um, so you start maybe out with a base machine learning model, but then um, the email program really learns from the users because each user has a different preference what constitutes spam. So each user wants to have different spam criteria maybe. So you have to learn the model for each user. So user, if a user one uses um, your email program for a while, so uh, user one will have, let's say model one, that is trained just to the user one behavior, user two will have a model two, and uh, user three will have a model three. So here, notice now that uh, the models are different and they are learned by the machine learning algorithm that you ship with the email program. So in this way, you don't care so much about um, the performance of an individual model in uh, point three, but you really care also about the machine learning algorithm. So which machine learning algorithm should you include here? Should you use a decision tree, a KNN, or a gradient, a boosting classifier, or random forest, and so forth? So here in step three, we, are, we care about comparing algorithms also, instead of just comparing uh, models to each other. Yeah, so before we go on to the next video, I want to uh, close this video with one more slide uh, so that you can think about these points before you start the next video. So here are some unfortunate facts about test sets. So first of all, um, the training set error is an optimistically biased estimator of the generalization error. This is just a fancy way of saying that the training set error is not trustworthy as the generalization error, because it's kind of yeah, uh, usually a little bit um, optimistically biased. It says, well, it means that um, due to overfitting, we can't really trust it because the training set error is usually better than, let's say, the test set error. So instead of error, let's maybe talk about accuracy. I find it usually a little bit more natural to talk about accuracy, which could be because um, yeah, uh, accuracy is what is used in scikit-learn and I use scikit-learn so much that I usually think more about accuracy instead of error. Um, also, it's more like a positive term. It's like accuracy is something positive or error is something negative. So let's say we get a 99% training accuracy. So is this good or not? I mean, no one can really tell. It really depends. Um, so how, how good your um, 
model is in terms of avoiding overfitting. So if you have a model that does not overfit at all, then a 99% training accuracy uh, yeah, would tell us it's actually a pretty good model. But um, if your model is overfitting, then it might be that the real performance is much lower than that. So for example, we may find that um, the model only has 80% um, test accuracy. So it's a large gap of 19 points. So in this case, the model would be heavily overfitting and the training accuracy would be an overly optimistic estimate of the tests uh, of the generalization um, accuracy, which can be estimated by the test set. So that's actually the second point. The test set error is an unbiased estimator of the generalization error. Given that we only use the test set once, and that we don't use the test set for choosing the model. Now, um, the, the unfortunate fact um, about the test set is that in practice, the test set error is actually pessimistically biased. So why is that? Why could the test set error be pessimistically biased? So that is a very, uh, you have to think a little bit about this to get the solution. It's not very obvious. It has something to do with resampling and the data set we work with. So I will let you think about it before we start the next video.